here in Philippians chapter 4, and just one verse as our text this morning, verse number 4. And it simply says this, rejoice in the Lord always, and again I say rejoice. And uh, let's go to the Lord in prayer. Father, we do thank you this morning for each one who's here. We thank you for, uh, Lord, the blessing of knowing you and uh, the blessing of having your word. And we pray that as we look into your word this morning that you'd speak to our hearts. Lord, uh, give us your strength. Give us your wisdom. And uh, Lord, I pray that you would be honored in all that's said and done. Lord, be honored in every decision that's made as a result of the message. Have your will and way, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. You know, this, obviously, uh, this epistle is written to uh, the church at Philippi. Philippi was a Roman colony. Uh, and so, as such, they were greatly uh, influenced by Roman culture, by Roman religion, and, of course, Almighty Caesar. There is a great influence there. And so when the believers in Philippi turned to the Lord Jesus for salvation, they set themselves at odds with the culture. Now let me kind of run down a little rabbit trail here. It doesn't take me long to find those, as you can tell. Uh, the idea that we need to be relevant to the culture and in tune with the culture is not biblical. Because these, in trusting the Lord, they were running counterculture. They were absolutely in opposition to, and we'll see this as we go through. So if we're going to follow the word of God, if we're going to follow the Lord Jesus Christ, we're not going to be relevant to the culture. We're going to be counterculture. And we're going to be looked at and despised as wicked people who don't really care about our nation and who don't really care about how things really are. And that's not the case at all. We care about our nation. We care about the way things ought to be, but the way things ought to be are not how our culture looks at it. The way things ought to be are found in the Word of God. But let's, let's go on. Uh, here's some of the things that were going on there in Acts chapter 16. Uh, this is where the Apostle Paul actually is in Philippi, and you find that there was a young lady following the Apostle Paul and those that were with him. And this young lady was a soothsayer, and the reason she was a soothsayer is because she was possessed, the Bible says, with the spirit of divination. In Acts 16 and verse 16, it says, And it came to pass, as we went to prayer, a certain damsel possessed with the spirit of divination met us, which brought our masters much gain by soothsaying. So this is, or apparently was commonplace and acceptable. It wasn't anything out of the ordinary uh, to the people there in Philippi. But you know God's opposed to that sort of thing? God's opposed to soothsaying. And you say, well, what is that? Well, uh, fortune telling, uh, tarot card reading, astrology, all those things. God's opposed to that. In Deuteronomy chapter 18 and verses 10 and 11, the scripture says, There shall not be found among you anyone, anyone that maketh his son or his daughter to pass through the fire or that useth divination. Well, that's what this woman was doing. She had a spirit of divination or an observer of times. What is that? That's astrology or an enchanter or a witch or a charmer or a consulter with familiar spirits or a wizard or a necromancer. God's opposed to that. And Jesus came, the scripture tells us, to destroy the works of the devil. And that includes those who are possessed by the devil. The Lord came to destroy that, that this woman could be set free from that possession. In 1 John chapter 3 and verse 8, the Bible says, He that uh, committeth sin is of the devil, for the devil sinneth from the beginning. For this purpose the Son of God was manifested, that he might destroy the works of the devil. And we think about the works of the devil. We talk about sin. We talk about being lost and so on like that. But it comes right down to the nitty-gritty. It comes right down to this. The Lord came to destroy this, that this woman would be to, uh, possessed by this devil, that this woman would be a soothsayer, a prophetic person. Uh, the Lord didn't want that, and the Lord was opposed to that. But again, that was acceptable in Philippian culture. 
That's what was going on. And so when people came to the Lord in Philippi, they were going against what was common and what was acceptable in the culture. Being a Christian was very nearly considered to be treason. If you go down just a few verses there in Acts chapter 16, you find the results uh, when, when the Lord freed this young lady of these uh, devils that had possessed her. Uh, the Bible says in verse 19, when her master saw that the hope of their gains was gone. So it's all about money for them. They caught Paul and Silas and drew them into the marketplace unto the rulers and brought them to the magistrates saying, these men being Jews do exceedingly trouble our city and teach customs which are not lawful for us to receive, neither to observe being Romans. This is illegal stuff. This is no good. This is, it's out of bounds. And again, very nearly treasonous. It's not lawful for us being Romans to even consider doing such things, to be involved in such things, even to listen to such things. And that's what they're saying. This is just not right. How much of real Bible preaching is acceptable to our culture today? Oh, we know. We know none of it is. I mean, let's be honest. Our culture is not, you know, we talk about America being a Christian nation. If our nation was really Christian, they would accept what the Word of God has to say. And our nation as a whole has rejected the teaching of the Word of God. And we can give example after example. I don't think I need to because, I mean, none of us are living in a cave somewhere. We know what's going on. We see what's happening in our country, and I think we understand that. For the Philippians... Turning to the Lord, being a Christian, that was sufficient cause to be mistreated by the crowd. Boy, does that sound familiar? That now, being a Christian in America, that's sufficient cause to be mocked. And, you know, to have your business closed down, to uh, be mistreated and misjudged by the majority of people. In Acts 16, 22, it says, And the multitude rose up together against them, against Paul and Silas, and the magistrates ran off their clothes and commanded to beat them. Uh, they didn't like that. So this is the situation, and this is the people to whom Paul wrote, Rejoice in the Lord always. And again, I say rejoice. Does it sound like there'd be much rejoicing there? Can you imagine if there was Facebook back in those days? Can you imagine what the post would look like? Oh, woe is me. You know, it's just so bad. You need to pray for me. I can't get out of bed today. You know, and uh, all those sorts of things. Of course, we have those posts today. Uh, anyway. So these believers, they were hated by all those around them. They were hated. So how is it impossible that how is it possible that Paul would instruct them to rejoice in the Lord? How is that possible? Doesn't even make sense, does it? We have to look beyond human reasoning and human logic when we come to the Word of God. That's a lot of our problem a lot of times. We we look at the Word of God from a human standpoint rather than from a spiritual standpoint. And when we look at the Word of God from a human standpoint, it makes no sense. But when we approach it from a spiritual standpoint, looking at, at things, then it makes a lot more sense. So let's think about this this morning. Who are the people of rejoicing? In other words, who is it that's supposed to be rejoicing always? Who is it? It is, according to Psalm 33, 1, it is the righteous. Uh, Psalm 33, 1 says, Rejoice in the Lord, O ye righteous, for praise is comely for the upright. Now, naturally, I, I know you didn't come to hear all this bad news, but naturally, none are righteous. That means you, and that means me. Uh, we know what the Bible says, for uh, none are right. As it is written, there is none righteous, no, not one. So that means this is talking to none of us, right? Oh, it doesn't stop there. And that's the good thing. That's the good news. It doesn't stop with there are none righteous, no, not one. God goes beyond because Jesus was sent to become our righteousness. 
Isn't that a good thing? First Corinthians chapter one and verse number 30 tells us, but of him are ye in Christ Jesus, who of God has made unto us wisdom and righteousness and sanctification and redemption. Thank God that God looked down from heaven and he saw us. None of us were righteous. There are none of us who sought after God. We're all gone out of the way. We're together become unprofitable. The way of God we have not known. There's no fear of God before our eyes. All those things that Romans chapter 3 tells us about us. And uh, God saw from heaven that that's how we were. God saw from heaven before he even said, let there be light. Before he ever created the heavens and the earth, he saw from heaven that that's how you and I would be. And he said to Jesus, you need to go that you might be their righteousness because they're none righteous. And thank God for that. So then we can be made righteous in him. Listen, we'll never live up to any sort of standard. You realize it doesn't matter how low the standard is. We never live up to it. Have you noticed that about human nature? We keep lowering the standard. Have you noticed that? I mean, we can talk about our public schools. The standard was a lot higher before I graduated. Yeah, I mean, before I ever entered school, the standard was higher. I've seen some of the tests, you know, from back in the day, uh, you know, back in the early 20th century. I, I've seen some of the tests graduating from 10th grade to see if you can even go into 11th. Finishing 12th grade, I couldn't have done those things. You know, some things they ask, are you kidding? My calculator doesn't do those things. <laughs> and uh, so, you know, they, they, by the time I came around, they had dumbed it down. And now it's even worse. Yeah. It's, it's much worse than it was then. We keep dumbing it down because our standards are, we're, we're just asking too much of our children. Really? You know, the idea is uh, if you don't expect much, you won't get much. When it comes to children, that's the way it is. And uh, I, I've learned that with my three boys. If I don't expect anything out of them, guess what I will get? I will get nothing out of them. I, I've learned that. But if I expect a great deal out of them, all of a sudden things change. As we lower the standards, everybody drops just under the standard. That's what we do. That's what we do. And uh, we, we cannot meet the standard ourselves. But we can be made righteous in him. Second Corinthians 5.21 says, For he hath made him to be sin for us who knew no sin, that we might be made the righteousness of God in him. You see, it never is our righteousness, and it never is about our righteousness because there are none righteous. So that's never the standard. It's always his righteousness. We can't meet that standard, so he grants his righteousness to us. What an amazing thing that is, that a holy God would grant his righteousness to us who are never going to be righteous in this life and in this body. What a great God we serve. And so, you know, how, how, how is it that we are made righteous? How is that possible? First of all, it's through hearing the word of God. Then faith cometh, so then faith cometh by hearing, and hearing by the word of God. But it's also receiving the message of the word of God by faith. You know, I, I talked about earlier when, when I was saved all those years ago, I heard the word of God. And that's what I believed. I believed the message of the word of God. That's where I placed my faith. And, and because I placed my faith in the message of the word of God, I placed my faith in Christ because Christ is the message of the word of God. You see, Romans chapter 10, verses 9 and 10, we know that if thou shalt confess with thy mouth the Lord Jesus and shalt believe in thine heart that God hath raised him from the dead, thou shalt be saved. For with the heart man believeth unto righteousness and with the mouth confession is made unto salvation. How does that righteousness come? It comes by believing the message of the word of God. And the message of the word of God is all about what Christ did in our place, what Christ did that we could never do on our own, that we could never accomplish as a group. 
He did it. And he provides it to us by faith. All others, they have no, no reason to rejoice in the Lord because the Bible says that they're enemies of God. You know, before I was saved, I was the enemy of God. I was a little kid when I was saved. But I was still the enemy of God because I was a sinner. I had no reason to rejoice in the Lord. You know, I watched dad and mom, and they rejoiced in the Lord and things that God had done. And I just kind of sit there and look at it, okay, all right. You know, not necessarily that I understand it, but whatever, you know. I guess that's what dad and mom, you know, what makes them happy, whatever. It didn't make sense to me. I didn't have anything to rejoice about. I was still God's enemy. I knew about it. I'd heard about it all my life. Dad and mom made sure I heard about it. They made sure I came to church and, and that I sat in Sunday school and that I sat through the church service. They made sure that I heard all about what God had done. But it didn't make any sense to me because I was on the other side. I was on the outside looking in. It didn't make any sense. So it's the righteous that can rejoice in the Lord. But in the context here, Paul is talking to who? Back in Philippians chapter 1 and verse number 1, at beginning the, uh, the epistle here, it says, Paul and Timotheus, the servants of Jesus Christ, to all the saints in Christ Jesus, which are at Philippi, with the bishops and deacons. It is the gathered righteous. It's more than just all the saved everywhere that he's talking to here. He's talking to a church. He's saying, as a church, you should rejoice in the Lord always. And I'll say this. It is God's will for every believer to become a member of a true New Testament church after their salvation. That's God's will. And we know that. Scripture tells us in Acts 2.41, Then they that gladly received his word were baptized, and the same day they were added unto them about 3,000 souls. I've never seen 3,000 people added to church membership at one time. I'd love to see it. I would love to have been there. You know, I, can, can you imagine the apostles after baptizing 3,000 people? Their arms have got to be tired. And, uh, and, you know, where did they baptize them? Did they go down the Jordan? I don't know. That would be a long ways away. Maybe not. You know, I don't know where they went. I don't know how they did it. I remember the first time I baptized was in the mountains of Papua New Guinea in the river. And uh, Dad said, I'm going to let you baptize today. And, of course, the, the church there had voted that, that I could do that. And so, man, I was so excited. And uh, the river there, of course, I said we're in the mountains, didn't I? So we're about 8,000 feet above sea level, and, and the river was fed off of a uh, lake up about 10,000 feet on Mount Wilhelm, tallest mountain in the country. And uh, so it, it, it's not warm there. You think tropics. It's like ice water, just running, 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 running. And, and uh, so about the second step into the water, my legs were numb. And uh, it was, it was a, a, an interesting story, but it was a very fast-flowing river at that point. It slowed down further on down the, the valley, but at that point, it was very fast-flowing. Dad never said anything about hanging on to the people you baptize. <laughs> and so, so I, I baptized this gentleman, Peter, and uh, I got him under the water, and then I reached out and grabbed him just as far as I could stretch. I grabbed him just as he was about to go downstream. I hope nothing like that happened to the apostles. Because you know if you start off that way and you've got 2,999 to go, some of them are going to say, uh-uh, I'm not going to do that. I'm not putting my life on my hand like that. But... He ended up fine. He, he's, uh, in fact, he's the pastor of the church there uh, now. He's been pastor there for 26 years. Amen. And the Lord's, the Lord's blessed, and the Lord's blessed his ministry. And so he survived. But they bought new property a little bit further up the mountain. And uh, the river, it's a little bit wider there and doesn't rush near as fast. I wonder if he had that in mind when they looked at that property. <laughs> But nonetheless, it is God's will for every believer 
to follow the Lord in believer's baptism and thus become a part of one of the Lord's churches. I mean, that, that's his will. And we see that this was written to the church because it's not just to all the saints because he, he narrows it down when he says with the bishops and deacons. Who do you think that might be? Well, you know there are people that run around and, and they appoint themselves bishops. You know, they appoint themselves apostles and, and so on. Of course, that's not what it's talking about. It's talking about a church there. And so that's what this is. You know, every church has its own personality. As we travel on deputation, we see that. You walk into some churches and you think, I'm already depressed. And uh, I haven't even met anybody. You just walk in the door and you, you can feel that, uh, that personality. You walk into other churches and, and you can feel the joy of the Lord there. And this is what the Lord wants. He wants this to be a part of the personality of every one of his churches. How does that happen? It only happens if the individual members are rejoicing in the Lord. That's how it happens. So, so who is it that's supposed to rejoice in the Lord? Uh, folks, it, that would be us. Us who know the Lord. That would be you who are members of this church and those who are members of every New Testament church. Let's look at the purpose of rejoicing. Why is it that we have, why is, you know, why is God making me rejoice? <laughs> we act that way to God sometimes, don't we? Why, why is God making me do this? Why is God making me do that? So why is God making me rejoice? Well, very simply here in verse 4, it's stipulated. Rejoice in the Lord always. You know, there's no option there, is there? If you so choose, you may rejoice in the Lord. It, it doesn't say that. It's a command. Rejoice in the Lord always. It is a command. Now, there's a lot more to it than this, so don't, don't just stop there. And, of course, if we really love the Lord, we're going to follow his commandments. This is what the Lord said. If you love me, keep my commandments. But beyond that, it is suitable for us to rejoice in the Lord. Again, in Psalm 33 and verse 1, Rejoice in the Lord, O ye righteous, for praise is comely for the upright. It's comely. It's suitable. It's appropriate for those of us who know the Lord to rejoice. Listen, and I'll talk about this here in a second. I'm sort of getting ahead of myself. But we are on our way to hell. God saved us. God gave us what we could never buy. We could not lie, cheat, or steal to get a ticket to heaven, to have our sins forgiven, to have an open door of fellowship with God today. We, there's no way we could come by that. And for those of us who know the Lord, it's appropriate for us to rejoice in the Lord. All those things being true. It's just appropriate. It is suitable. It is safe. Look in uh, chapter 3 and verse 1, Philippians. It says, finally, my brethren, rejoice in the Lord. Do you think that Paul was trying to get a point across? Finally, my brethren, rejoice in the Lord to write the same things to you. To me, indeed, is not grievous. But for you, it is what? Safe. Why is it that we have to rejoice in the Lord? Because it's safe. It's safe to rejoice in the Lord. You know, there's so many things out there that are unsafe. When, when we were in Papua New Guinea, we, we lived out in the bush. That's where our ministry was. And we would go into town to buy our supplies. Uh, when we first moved in the bush, it was about an hour and a half trip. And uh, there toward the end, it was three and a half hours. It's because maintenance is not a word in their language. They didn't maintain the roads, and they were bad. But anyway, we'd get into town, and we would pull up. And more than once, this happened. We'd pull up, and of course, the boys were there in, in the back seat of our vehicle. And uh, as soon as we'd stop the vehicle, someone would walk up, and they'd say, I see you have three boys there. You be really careful with them because... There were some kids kidnapped here just the other day. So you be really careful with those kids. And we were careful with them because we wanted them to be safe. We rejoice in the Lord because it is safe. There is protection in rejoicing in the Lord. You know what happens when we're upset and when we're bitter 
and when we're just unhappy. Do you, do you know what happens there? Do you know what we're doing? We're opening a door for the devil to get in and to do all kinds of things in our mind and do all kinds of things in our heart and to, to put all kinds of plans in our minds. Hey, you, you need to do this. You need to, oh, forget what God said. That's not working for you. You need to come over here and do this. It is safe to rejoice in the Lord. It is safe for us to do that. It is simple. In uh, Joel chapter 2 and verse 23, it says, Be glad then, ye children of Zion, and rejoice in the Lord your God, for he hath given you the former rain moderately, and will cause to come down for you the rain, the former rain, and the latter rain in the first month. It is simple. Listen, there are so many simple things for which we can rejoice in the Lord. Listen, how many of you got out of bed this morning? Yeah, I know there's only two or three of you that did that. The rest of you are still in bed. Oh, you understand what I'm saying. You say, but that's a simple thing. Can we not rejoice in the Lord because he gave us the ability to get up, to get dressed, and to make our way down to God's house? Can we not rejoice in that? Uh, when, when I was pastoring, I had a lady, lady in our church, uh, Viola. She was a, she was a blessing. Uh, but she was she was in a retirement home, not a nursing home, but a retirement home. And I used to go visit her every week. And I had to sit and talk with her. And she'd say, I don't know why I'm here. I can't get out, can't go anywhere. She couldn't come to church. She couldn't do anything. She said, I can't do anything. I don't know why God's left me here. The only thing I can do is pray. And I said, Viola, as long as you're praying, I'm going to pray that God keeps you here. Because I need it. Uh, you know, and the church needs it. Uh, you know, we need, you know, somebody praying for us. She used to call me up Sunday morning. And, and, and you know, I don't know how the Lord worked it out, but it, it usually was just as I was finishing uh, my final preparations for preaching that morning before anybody showed up at the church. She'd call up to the church. She'd say, Preacher, I just want you to know that I prayed for you, and I prayed for the service today, and I prayed that God blesses. And I'm telling you, I rejoiced in the Lord over that. I rejoiced in the Lord that she was praying. She couldn't make it to church. And here we are, and we're upset about it. I hope nobody's upset that you're here this morning. But, you know, I'm talking about the simple things. You know, sometimes the simple things are having ice cream. Thank you. I was waiting for somebody to say amen to that. You know, somebody ought to say amen to that. You know, that's, that's something simple. It's something we take for granted, don't we? I can remember the days, again, as a teenager in Papua New Guinea, we had ice cream there. It was called New America. came from New Zealand. New Zealand didn't know anything about American ice cream, let me tell you. Uh, but this New American ice cream, it would... Uh, you know, in shipment from New Zealand to uh, Papua New Guinea, it melts and refreeze. You know what happens to ice cream when it melts and refreezes? It has the consistency of comet. <laughs> and there were many times we had ice cream that had the consistency of comet. And it was, it was awful stuff, but we ate it anyway because it's all we had. And then now we get ice cream and we rejoice in that. It's a simple thing. A sim Do you understand what I'm saying this morning? There are so many things that God gives us. They're gifts that he gives us. Every day, simple, simple things. The ability to be with friends and loved ones. You know, deputation, it's not, it's not fun all the time. But one thing I am happy about is that I always have my wife and my boys with me. I love my wife. I love my boys. I love having them with me. And, you know, fellows who do deputation by themselves, God bless them. I don't know how they do it. And, uh, and, and I, you know, I'm, I'm thankful that uh, my wife didn't want me to go by myself. She said, no, we're in this together. We need to go together. Which is fine because I told her, pack up and get in the car, we're leaving. <laughs> so it worked out really good. And of course, the boys, I said, get in the truck. You know, there's just, you know, not a lot of choice for them. 
But the thing is, that, that's just a simple thing. But I rejoice in the Lord that I have my family with me. Not just that they're with me physically, but it, when it comes to the work that God has called us to do, they're with me spiritually as well. They have a desire to help. They have a desire to be a part. And that's a simple thing. But it's not a simple thing. That's a big thing. I thank God for that. And we ought to rejoice in the Lord for the simple things that God does for us every day. God does things for us all the time. Simple things. Now, these last three and a half years on deputation, we have not had a home. People say, you know, boy, it's nice to be on vacation. Well, it is when you go for a week or two weeks and then come home. But when you do it for three and a half years and you have nowhere to go home to, that's not any fun. And, you know, we have, usually we have our cargo trailer because we had to have our winter clothes and our summer clothes. We had to have everything in our cargo trailer because we had no home to put anything in. And so here, the end of July, we move up to Canada. We rented a house. And, and not just any little, you know, cardboard box somewhere by a dumpster. God gave us a nice house. Four bedroom. I have an office. I don't have to share with nobody. I mean, I can shut the door, put out the do not disturb sign, and I can study to my heart's content. It's so much better than being in a motel room with four other people trying to study. You know, and I'm not complaining. I, you know, don't, don't misunderstand. I'm just thankful that God's done that for us. And uh, it shouldn't have been like that. It shouldn't, you know, we, we have no, as far as Canada's concerned, we have no credit history. We have no rental history. We have nothing. And here, God laid it on the heart of, of our landlord. We walked in the door and he said, I'm getting good vibes. <laughs> Whatever it was, it was the Lord letting him know, this, this is okay. He's not a saved man, so you can pray for him. And uh, he's, he's, he and his wife already told us, don't be surprised if we don't show up for service sometime once you start. And so we're excited about that too. But uh, God's given us a beautiful place to live in. That's a simple thing. We take that for granted, don't we? It's a simple thing. We ought to rejoice in the Lord for the simple things. You know... It is sure. The purpose of our rejoicing is because it is sure. In uh, Romans chapter 12 and verse 12, it says, Rejoicing in hope, patient in tribulation, continuing instant in prayer. Rejoicing in hope. Now remember, the word hope in the scripture does not have to do with I wish so, and I, you know, it'd be nice if it were this way, but it probably won't. The word hope in the scripture has to do with our confidence and our assurance. Rejoicing in confidence. Listen, the things that God tells us in his word, they are true. We have to accept them by faith, but they are true. And we can rejoice in those things that we have not yet seen. Amen. Isn't that what uh, Peter says about the Lord? Whom having not seen, ye love. We rejoice in hope that we will see our Lord. We will stand before him. We will see. We, we read through the book of Revelation and, and we read about the new Jerusalem. I'm excited about seeing that myself. I don't know about you, but I'm excited about seeing a city 1,500 miles four square with one street. Yeah. that make any sense to you? How do you have one street? I don't know, but I'm going to see it and I can't wait. I'm rejoicing in hope because I know I'm going to see it. I have no doubt because God told us so. And I'm rejoicing in hope. And then <laughs> we ought to rejoice because it's seductive. And I, I'm using that in a positive way. It's we can't help but rejoice when we consider all that God did for us to save our soul. In Isaiah chapter 61 and verse 10, 
The Bible says, I will greatly rejoice in the Lord. My, my soul shall be joyful in my God, for he hath clothed me with the garments of salvation. He hath covered me with the robe of righteousness as a bridegroom decketh himself with ornaments and as a bride adorneth herself with her jewels. When we think about what God did in saving us and what we were and where we were, and we think that he saved us. We can't help but rejoice in the Lord. We cannot help it. And if you are saved and you can help it, there's a problem. And we'll talk about that here in just a second. But there's also the place of rejoicing. Where is it? Where is it that I need to rejoice? Where is it that I should do that? We should rejoice in supernatural victory. You know, things happen in life, don't they? Good things happen in life, and we've talked about that already, but there are things that happen in life that are not good. Anybody ever been there? We were driving one time in New Mexico, and uh, if you've ever been there, New Mexico is a dry place. And uh, we, were, we were driving, we were going down from uh, uh, Albuquerque down to Roswell, and there's just a whole lot of nothing there. I mean, you just... You don't, you don't count fence posts. You, you count grains of sand, you know, as they blow by. It's just, I mean, there's nothing there. And uh, we got out there, and uh, we were about halfway uh, down to Roswell from Albuquerque when I realized there were no gas stations. And I realized I needed gas. And uh, so anyway, we, we did some praying, and, uh, and we didn't make it. And uh, we ran out of gas, and we didn't have a gas can. We didn't have anything. Uh, but anyway, uh, where we stopped was right across the road where, from where they were putting up an oil rig. I mean, they were putting it together, and then they were going to take it out into the field. And so Jared and I, we were going to walk into town. We were, about, we were about two miles from town. That's how close we got. So close, but, uh, you know, it didn't, didn't win the prize. And as we got out to walk, they, were, they started yelling at us from over there on the oil rig. And they said, did you run out of gas? Well, yeah, we did. You know, it's, it's one of those things you don't really want to admit, but you kind of have to because it's obvious. And they said, well, just wait a minute. And one of the guys came, got in his truck, took us into town. And, uh, you know, we, we, got, we bought a gas can, got gas, and came back out. He put it in the car for us, and off we went. Boy, that was an amazing thing. God does great things for us, and, and that's just a little thing, but God brings us through, and sometimes we come through things in life, and we say, I don't know how. I don't know how I came through this, but here I am. I'm still standing. I'm, I'm still living, and I'm still serving the Lord, and we can rejoice in those times. In Isaiah 41 and verse 14, it says, Fear not, thou worm Jacob, and ye men of Israel, I will help thee, saith the Lord, and thy Redeemer, the Holy One of Israel. Behold, I will make thee a new sharp uh, threshing instrument having teeth, and thou shalt thresh the mountains and beat them small and shall make the hills as chaff. Thou shalt fan them, and the wind shall carry them away, and the whirlwind shall scatter them, and thou shalt rejoice in the Lord and shalt glory in the Holy One of Israel. What is he saying? I'm going to do with you some miraculous things. It's amazing over the years, looking back, at some of the things that God has allowed our family to do for him. Things that we couldn't have done on our own. But God used us to do those things. And we look at those things and we say, it's all because of God. It's all what he's done. We realize how small we are and how that it's not us that brought this great victory. It's our God. He's the one who's done it. And that's when we rejoice in the Lord. But I tell you, we also ought to rejoice in the Lord in the sorrowful valleys. Over in the book of Habakkuk, chapter 3, verses 17 and 18, the scripture says, Although the fig tree shall not blossom, neither shall bear fruit, uh, I'm sorry, neither shall fruit be in the vines. The labor of the olive shall fail, and the field shall yield no meat. The flock shall be cut off from the fold, and there shall be no herd in the stalls. 
yet will I rejoice in the Lord. I would joy in the God of my salvation when times are bad. Because listen, we're still in this world. We're still in this flesh. Things are not done. The end of the story has not yet been written. And there are things that we go through, awful things, terrible things that we all face. This last year has been hard for our family. My wife lost her dad. My wife lost her sister a month after she lost her dad. I lost my uncle and my aunt all in this last year. And uh, I told my wife, I'm sick of funerals. You know, it seems like, it, you know, every time we turn around, we're going to a funeral. They're no fun. But even in those times, we ought to rejoice in the Lord. Because even in the hard times, our God is still good. He hasn't left us by ourselves. Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil, for thou art with me. Thy rod and thy staff, they comfort me. We have reason to rejoice in the Lord even when times are hard, even when we don't know what the next step ought to be, even when we don't know where the next meal is going to come from. Even though we don't understand what's going on, we ought to rejoice in the Lord because, listen, He's not left us alone. He has not left us by ourselves to go through things. He's always there. He is, according to Isaiah 41, He is there holding our hands. As a father holds a child's hand, He's there. Then there needs to be a sustained vigilance. That's when we need to rejoice all the time. Rejoice in the Lord always. And again, I say rejoice. You see, it was so important for the Philippian church to understand this that Paul said it twice. We need to understand that we need to rejoice in the Lord all the time. Boy, it's good to rejoice in the Lord. But guess what? Monday's coming. I'm sorry to end on that depressing note. But Monday is coming, and guess what? We've got to face real life come Monday. Not that this is not real life. Don't misunderstand. But we're going to go back into the same old thing, facing the same old people. You know, I, you know, I know what it is to go to work and think, oh, man, I don't want to see this person. I know what they're going to do. I know what they're going to say. It's, they're going to do nothing but cause me problems and all that. It doesn't matter where you work. doesn't matter what your job is. Those people are everywhere. And I think their purpose in life is to make our life miserable. <laughs> I understand it's not that way, but sometimes it seems like that. But tomorrow, will we still rejoice in the Lord? That's what we're supposed to do. It's what we ought to do. Listen, if you're still saved tomorrow, you have reason to rejoice in the Lord. Because you know what? In eternity, if that person's saved, who's giving you all that problem, they're going to have an attitude adjustment. <laughs> or maybe you will, you know, whoever the problem is, you know. And guess what? We can rejoice together. Uh, you know, we can't really... Think of all the places we ought to rejoice. One last thing, one last place we ought to rejoice. In, in Psalm 85 and verse 6, Wilt thou not revive us again, that thy people may rejoice in thee? And I already talked about people who are saved who don't know how to rejoice in the Lord. You, you know what the problem is? They need revival. That's what they need. When you can be saved and you can read about what God did for you in saving your soul and say, yeah, eh, kind of shrug the shoulder, 
not really care and just go on. You need revival. I'm serious. You need revival. You need you need to see again what Christ did for you at Calvary. That's what you need. You need to see again that empty tomb where Christ came out victorious over sin, over hell, and over death, and he did it for you. Let me tell you something. You go to Calvary and you see what Christ did, and you go to the tomb and you see what Christ did there. You cannot help but be revived. You cannot help but rejoice in the Lord and rejoice in all that he's done. You're not rejoicing. That's what you need to do. Go back again. Remind yourself of all that God's done for you. Let me tell you, just like what we talked about salvation, then it comes to the point where you can't help but rejoice in the Lord. You can't help it. God's too good to us not to. Let's stand together this morning with our heads bowed and our eyes closed. Listen, if you're here this morning and you say, I I don't know what you're talking about as far as rejoicing in the Lord. I don't get it. The reason is you don't know what it is to have your sins forgiven. You don't know what it is to have fellowship with God. You don't know what it is to have the assurance of eternity with God in heaven. Maybe you're here this morning, you're saved, but you've not been rejoicing in the Lord. You've been having a a spiritual pity party. It's kind of, oh, poor me, you know, because nobody knows the trouble I've seen, and nobody knows my sorrow. When the Bible says, there's no temptation taking you, but such as is common to man. We've all gone through heartache. We've all gone through problems. Listen, We can all rejoice in the Lord.